Many of us have personal tales of dwindling and reigning congregations, of judicatories that are financially imploding, of seminaries that are closing, and of ministers who must be bivocational by necessity and not by choice. At least in the old Protestant mainline, there really is a pervasive sense of malaise. In the end of the book, White Christ The End of White Christian America, Robert Jones proposes that church cultures, like individuals, go through stages of grief. I could say that in the 1970s, the Protestant mainline was largely in the denial stage, saying the seeming decline of fervor and numbers and cultural influence is just a blip. It's an anomaly. The baby boomers will get married, have children, and come back. Well, 60% of them did not. And then there's anger. The churches are declining. It must be somebody's fault. Probably the nasty evangelicals who are cycling <laughs> people out of our congregations. And then bargaining. Maybe not so much with God, but just with reality. Maybe if we had bigger parking lots or more entrepreneurial leaders, everything would be hunky dory. Now I hope we are not reaching the resignation stage of well, we're going down the tubes and there's nothing we can do about it. At least that kind of thing. But then by facing reality, some new visions and some new hopes might be birthed. In order to get to the hope, we have to take a look, a hard look, at some trends and at some likelihoods to see both the opportunities, the possibilities, First, the depressing stuff. So this is going to kind of be like an old-fashioned evangelical revival. First, there's the bad news, you're probably going to hell, and then that will be followed by some good news. <laughs> so this is, we're all going to hell part. It's not your imagination. Institutional Christianity really is contracting in the United States. And so are most other religions, not only expressions of Christianity, but most other religions. <laughs> now I want to emphasize two points about this that are often missed. One, it's not just the Protestant main line that seems to be in decline. It's every form of Christianity. And number two, it's not your fault. About a month ago, the Pew Research Center released a report on Christianity in the U.S. based on a comparison of telephone surveys taken in 2009 and then again in 2019. Their data was gleaned from political polls that used random telephone dialing. The conclusions were corroborated by the Pew Center's more detailed religious landscape studies of 2007 and 2014, and by trends documented by the General Social Survey of the University of Chicago. So this stuff is based on the analysis of empirical data. So here's what to many would look like bad news. In the USA, in 2019, 65% of all adults in the USA have identified themselves as Christian, which is down 12% from a decade ago. So that's a 12% decline in a 10-year period. That's, that's pretty colossal. And then, on the other hand, 26% of adults describe themselves as unaffiliated. Now that's an ambiguous category that includes atheists, agnostics, or people who say that they are nothing in particular, or that they just don't care. And this has an increase of 17% from 2009. So, the unaffiliated up by uh, 17%.
within that unaffiliated category. Atheists are about 4%, which is up just 2% from 2009. But even that's significant because the percentage of atheists had held steady for three or four decades uh, from, from the very beginnings of polio. So this is the first time that the percentage has gone up. Um, agnostics are at 5%, which is up 3%. But the nothing in particular self-description has reached 17%, which is up 42% from 2000. So that's a huge leap in unaffiliated. Now the decline from 2009 affects all Christian traditions. Right now, about 20% of Americans are Catholic, and that's down 3% from 2009. Right now, about 43% of the adult population is Protestant, which is down 8% from 2009. So, Protestants are declining at a more rapid pace than Catholics by about 5%. Now, you might think that the decline in percentages is due to the fact that America is getting more religiously pluralistic. You might just think, well, there's a bigger pie now with more Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims. So, of course, the percentage of Christians is going down. But that's not the case. The non-Christian population only grew modestly during the decade. The U.S. is now... 2% Jewish, 1% Muslim, 1% Hindu, and 1% Buddhist. That's not a lot of members of other religions. So Christianity's decline is not the fruit of religious multiculturalism. Now you might also have thought that the decline in percentages is simply due to the growth of the population. But again, that isn't true. There has been a drop in the absolute numbers of Christians, not just the percentages, in the U.S., from about 178 million in 2009 to about 167 million now. And during that time, that 10-year period, the population grew about 23 million. So changes in the population doesn't account for what seems to be now, if you haven't had enough yet, here's more bad news. <laughs> the ranks of the religiously unaffiliated are growing mostly among young adults. Well, 84% of the silent generation, those are those born between 1928 and 1945, report being Christian now. That's 85%, that's a high percentage. And 76% of baby boomers, those born between 1946 and 1964, report being Christian. Only 67% of Generation X, those born between 1965 and 80, identify as Christian. And only 49% of millennials, those born between 1981 and 1996, describe them as Christian. So generationally, the drop is from uh, 84% to 49%, and that correlates with generational change. The majority of millennials who do not claim to be Christian are mostly secular. They don't claim to be anything. <coughs> and only 10% of millennials identify with non-Christian faiths. So the conclusion there is, particularly among younger generations, the number of unaffiliated and, some surveys suggest, uninterested in religion has grown astronomically. Now, you might suppose that the influx of Hispanic immigrants would help re-spiritualize the country. They have a reputation of being either Catholic or Pentecostal. But, not so much. The number of religiously unaffiliated Hispanics has grown by 15% in the past decade. 
and now stands at 23%. 23% of Hispanics are not affiliated with Christianity or with any other religious group. Among the Hispanic population, the number of Protestants grew by 1%, but the number of Catholics declined by 57%. So among Hispanics, the, the, the attachment to Catholicism is, is just going down the tubes. <clears throat> you might expect that maybe white Christianity is doing poorly, but maybe African American Christianity is doing much better. And actually, it is. The, thought, the data about African American Christianity is soft and hard to interpret, but it seems that uh, black churches are holding their own in numbers, but attendance is down. And there is a decline. It's documented all over the place in young male members. So that's a very <coughs> discouraging sign. And a decline in interest on the part of African American youth. So if you were saying, well, maybe the African American churches can become the missionaries that will re spiritualize the white churches, maybe not. Or you might suspect that this is a regional problem, perhaps confined to the worldly and liberal Northeast and the West Coast. But again, not so much. The sharpest decline in the Protestant population has occurred in the South, in the Southeast. And the sharpest decline of, of Catholics has occurred in the Northeast, their traditional homeland. Or, you may be saying to yourself, well, the main line's doing poorly, but at least the evangelicals are thriving. Maybe they will be the primary bearers of the Christian legacy. Maybe they will even mature spiritually and drift leftward into the main line. <laughs> <laughs> and replenish the dwindling supply of Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and UCC people. Again, I'm afraid I must disappoint. The percentage of Protestants who claim to be born again has stayed at about the same level for the past decade. They're not grown. Only about 16% of the U.S. population claim to be born again white Protestants. Now that's more than the 12% of the population that self-identify as uh, white Protestant mainliners who are not born again. I almost, I almost like that question, you know, or do you count yourself as a not born again Christian? <laughs> uh, but that's still, on the evangelical side, not a sign of health. And in fact, in the last 10 years, for the first time, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is usually regarded as the flagship of the evangelical Christianity in the United States has reported first a slower rate of growth and now in the last three years an absolute decline in, in total numbers. You might think that megachurches are doing okay and that maybe those people will spiritually grow up and turn up in uh, more traditional congregations. But again, their heyday is over. They're holding their own numerically, but they're not growing, and their attendance is down. The average person only attends, who goes to a megachurch, only goes once a month, and they only stay for five years. So it's something of a revolving door. And when they leave, they tend to become nothing. So, what do all these complicated and, frankly, depressing statistics, percentages, and numbers mean. <coughs> well, I think when you add them all up, it means the United States is not really becoming more multi-religious. It's slowly becoming more secular. And that trend towards all religiosity, no religion, no religious interest whatsoever, is strongest in the younger generations. Often it has been said that Max Weber's secularization thesis that, that the rise of science and technology would be the death knell of religion uh, 
wasn't true for the United States, that the United States was exceptional. And it might be true of Northern Europe, it might be true of England, it might be true of Scandinavia, it might be true of Northern Germany, but it couldn't possibly be true of the United States because we Americans are uniquely spiritual. <laughs> I had a friend in Denmark, and Christianity has taken big hits in Northern Europe. I was in Copenhagen for uh, Palm Sunday once, and there were literally more clergy officiating than there were congregants in the Jews. <laughs> Because the clergy are supported by tax dollars. And they're, they're, they don't need a congregation, actually. There's just sort of a discouragement to church growth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and, and I pointed that out. Uh, and, and, and I said to a Lutheran minister friend of mine that were, um, what's, what's, what's the deal here? You're, why do you even continue to have worship services when people don't come? Uh, and I said, this. It, it's, it's not like this in the United States. Uh, and then he, he, he remarked, I know you Americans think that you are uniquely spiritual, but maybe it's not that. Maybe you're just culturally slow. <laughs> and secularism will catch up, and that may be the case. So, I'm going to talk just a little bit about why is this Happening. Well, one, I'm just going to, I'm not going to endorse any of these theories, but just report them and leave them to you to adjudicate. Well, there is the, the, the old Weber thesis that it's uh, science and technology that's leading to a sense of disenchantment uh, of the universe. We no longer live in an age of angels and demons. Uh, we, we now, we, we don't pray that the lights will come on. Uh, we flip the switch. So we become accustomed to empirical and very uh, material, physical explanations for why things happen. Well, that might be part of it. Who knows? Another theory is it's really a rise in the standard of living. Better living through chemistry. <laughs> Life on Earth can be pretty good if you play your cards right. If you have adequate health care, adequate uh, financial resources. Uh, maybe you can keep tragedy at a minimum in your life. So somehow or other, we, our culture has gotten used to the notion, of the expectation of worldly flourishing, and maybe to flourish in this life, to have some res uh, to have some fun, go on vacations, uh, have a nice house, a couple of cars, uh, a stable family, maybe a little social justice on the side, uh, that that has become the premier hope for many folk, and it's an entirely this-worldly hope. Okay, another theory, and this one I kind of like, um, maybe the combination of religious pluralism and mobility made it inevitable that religious fervor and allegiance would decline. According to sociologists like Peter Berger, religions flourish best when they have in place what he calls plausibility structures. When everybody you know and trust believes and values pretty much the same thing. But when that erodes and you live in a situation where you're in close proximity with people who don't believe what you believe, then that casts some doubts on your own system. How do you know you're right and they're wrong? Let me give a little personal testimony about that. I, I, I grew up in a small town in New Jersey with about 2,000 people. There were only two kinds of people in that town. There were Baptist people and there were Methodist people. <laughs> my mother was a Baptist and my father was a Methodist and I was regarded as the product of a mixed marriage. <laughs> Everybody watched me to see how I'd turn out. Uh, and I grew up thinking that the only interesting religious question that remains to be solved is can salvation be lost? My mother said no, my father said yes. So I thought that was normal. The, the director of my Sunday school, my Sunday school teacher, was also the football coach for the high school, who was also the chemistry teacher, who also did the prayers before all municipal events. My Sunday school class marched in civic parades, so I thought 
The whole world is Methodist or Baptist. Those are the only two options. And anybody who is not Methodist or Baptist must be deranged or psychologically aberrant. <laughs> and then I went to college and met my three roommates. Uh, one was a very secular Jew who hated religion. One was a member of the Black Panther Party and therefore was a Marxist. And uh, a, another of my roommates uh, was a, a Hindu whose last name was Krishna. And I didn't know how religious to realize that's the name of the Hindu god. So I asked him why he was, had that name. And he just, without hesitating, said, that's my father. I said, hmm. That's interesting. Um, Krishna is your father. Explain. And then he elaborated that his mother had been what we would probably call a temple prostitute. So whenever she worshipped uh, with a male co-religionist, he was for that moment the incarnation of Krishna. So Krishna was his father. So I said, I can't wait for parents' day. <laughs> uh, so when I realized that this is different from being Baptist or Methodist. But the, the other thing was, they all lent me money. And they were all nice to me. We all got along. So as a result, I had to say, how do I know I'm right? And that the value system that I grew up with matches reality. And that they're wrong, because they believe what they believe just as deeply as I do. So, quickly talk about Burton. When you take mobility, social mobility, geographic mobility, and mix it with a, with a situation of religious and ideological pluralism, everybody's religious attachments are going to be diminished and maybe even threatened. I mean, it was one thing to grow up in Lidditz uh, 50 years ago. You'd be Marine. You'd eat sugar cookies and have those Christmas stars. But there was no other option. But not so much now. Another theory. Maybe advertising and the entertainment industry and the possibility of self-medication have created a culture of escapism. So maybe it's the case that if you're having some spiritual uh, um, yearnings and strange desires in your heart for something more fulfilling than this life can provide, all you have to do now is buy another product, <coughs> go on the internet, or go to a sporting event, and forget about it. So maybe the fact that we are, escapism is so easy now, and our, our culture thrives on it, maybe there's not enough quiet time and private time for spirituality to flourish. A book just came out and said that Google is our new God, and that most of the attributes that had been ascribed to God are now ascribed to Google. It's omnipresent. It's omniscient. You can trust Google. So given all that, is there any hope? <laughs> well, I think there is. And I'm going to appeal to uh, Phyllis Tickle, who said that about every 500 years, Christianity has a run of sale. Basically, it reinvents itself. Now, I think the 500-year thing is a little arbitrary and uh, confining, but Christianity has reinvented itself periodically through its history. Did it with the Constantinian Revolution. It did it with the rise of monasticism. It did it with the rise of the papacy. It did it with the uh, Protestant Reformation. It did it with the um, dialogue with the Enlightenment. It happens, uh, that actually, maybe every century or two. So maybe we're just at the cusp of something new where Christianity will take a new form. Now, what might that form be? That's the big question. Well, I'm just going to make some proposals, and then maybe we can talk about these. Here are some theories I've heard floated around about what Christianity will be like 20 years from now. And it won't be kind of Christianity we know now. It won't, particularly, it won't be the Protestant mainline. And this also would apply to Judaism and Islam to an extent in the United States. Maybe there'll be a giant mainline Protestant 
denominational merger. So there will all be Presky, Palian, Lutherish, UCC, yes. and Methodist, and liberal Baptists. Um, as ecumenism thrives and doctrinal differences seem to be less important, and uh, the, the, the notion of uh, um, you can get more accomplished with greater numbers takes hold, maybe there will be a generic form of Protestantism, and maybe that will thrive. It might attract new people. So I'll leave that on the table. <coughs> then there's the opposite opinion. It goes like this. Generic anything these days is not attractive. We don't live in the age of Budweiser anymore. We live in the age of the microbreweries. We live in the age of niche markets. So, so this says, no, sorry, but a giant generic Protestant denomination is not going to thrive. It would be so boring that nobody would really be interested in it at all. And then what will thrive are smaller, largely countercultural, almost sectarian groups of Christians and other religious people. Groups with clear identity markers. And you know, 20 years ago, sociologist Rodney Stark, who does not claim to be a person of faith at all, proposed that it's the groups who know that they're different from everybody else and knows what makes them different. Those are the ones who have staying power and can pass on their vision to future generations. And so he mentioned, for example, uh, and studied uh, the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, the Mormon uh, tradition. It said they're growing, and it's partly because if you're a Mormon, you know what makes you a Mormon, and you know you're different. Same could be said of Pentecostals. If you want to speak in tongues, you know that makes you different. And you know you better do it in church because if you do it on the streets or in a mall, you'll get arrested. Uh, so it said groups that, that have ident clear identity markers and don't have very amorphous boundaries those are the groups that will thrive uh, and survive. And just as a little anecdote to support that, I have a, a nephew who is a uh, member of Generation X. Uh, maybe he's, he's right on the cusp of Generation X and Millennial. They went to a, a Methodist church for a while, uh, and, and they stopped. And I asked him, I asked him why. And he said, well, I got the impression that the whole point of being Methodist was to be a nice, kind, compassionate person who has a modicum of interest in social justice. And they said, I, I can do that all by myself. I said, I can just go to a political rally. I can just support Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. I can do that without getting up on Sunday morning or timing. So that's the, the main line will serve, parts of the main line will survive, but only insofar as they have a clear identity and can articulate that and make that clear to the rest of the world. So strangely, for UCC people, it might lead to the conclusion that the national UCC church might eventually disappear, but the order of Corpus Christi won't, because they have unique rituals, they have a unique value system, a unique theology. Or the Amish aren't going anywhere. They're actually doing okay. It's not just birth rate. They're, they're attracting new members. Okay, so that's, that's, that's another proposal. Then yet a different one is maybe the, the movement that's been called the emerging church, maybe that's the wave of the future. And that's what religion in America might be like 20 years from now. This is what might appear to the spiritual but not religious folk. Because the emergent church movement does not celebrate church membership. They usually don't have membership roles. It's just that people come to their meetings sometimes and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they connect on the internet. Sometimes they meet in people's living rooms. Sometimes they meet in coffee houses. Sometimes they meet in bars. So the boundaries are very, very fluid. 
And what really holds them together is that the folk who come have religious and spiritual questions. And they want to share their questions and talk it through rather than coming with the expectation of receiving an answer. So it's held together by the questions rather than the answer. So some groups are held together, if they're explicitly Christian, by the question, what is the significance of Jesus of Nazareth? They're not held together by any particular answer to that question, but just the willingness to explore the question itself. So maybe religious groups of the future will be highly eclectic, very fluid, non-institutional, and in some, some extreme cases, might um, be more of a, uh, a hybrid mixture of Christianity and other things as people splice some elements of traditional Christianity together with elements of Buddhism or yogic practices uh, or New Age spirituality or something. Two more possibilities. One is, what if there will be a fourth Great Awakening? A lot of historians count three Great Awakenings. The first, I think Jonathan Edwards, 1730s. The next one, Cambridge Revivalism, the, uh, around 1800. The third, the Azusa Street Pentecostal Revival in the early 20th century in Los Angeles. And maybe, there is going to be a wave of piety, and it will largely be Pentecostal. Pentecostalism is growing, growing by leaps and bounds in the southern hemisphere, in Africa, Central America, South America, Southeast Asia, um, and growing modestly in the United States, and not just through immigration. So maybe the old Protestant main line will be the Pentecostal mission field there will be a surprising movement of the spirit that will uh, awaken uh, us slumbering people. And then there's one that, frankly, i got to confess, I don't like, but there might be truth in it. So this is not, on my part, aspirational. Maybe what will survive 20 years from now will be civil religion. An amalgamation of Christianity and prevalent political ideologies. Now, we've always had civil religion in the United States, but what's been unique in about the last 30 years is that there are two of them. There's a religion of the Republican right and a religion of the Democratic left. And maybe what will fuel religion in the future will be political allegiances. So you'll have a Republican religion and a Democratic religion. You can all already see the beginnings of that. Um, after the last presidential election, pollsters in North Carolina interviewed people uh, and asked about who they voted for, and also asked them about their religious affiliation. One of the questions was, are you an evangelical? And the folk who said that they had voted for Donald Trump often, like the majority of them, reported, yes, I am an evangelical. But then the follow-up questions were, so, you're an evangelical. Do you read the Bible frequently? And the answer was usually, no. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had a conversion experience, a born-again experience? And the answer was, what's that? <laughs> yeah, and do you look to Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? And the answer was usually, I guess so. Am I supposed to? Uh, and what became clear is that they were self-identifying as evangelical, but they didn't really know what it meant. And what they meant by evangelical was simply, I'm a member of the religious right. And they thought evangelical and religious right were coterminous and, and synonymous. So according to some, what will survive are highly politicized forms of Christianity, in which Christianity just provides a sort of cover for a uh, political program. It becomes the cheering squad or the chaplaincy corps of a political movement. So those are the primary prognostications that are kicking around. And I'll just repeat them. Maybe a giant, mainline, merged ecumenical denomination. That's one. Two, maybe smaller countercultural groups 
of Christians who have clear identity markers, who know who they are, know what they believe, know they're different. That's two. Three, the emerging church, eclectic, fluid, non-institutional, maybe multi-religious. Fourth, a fourth great awakening, probably Pentecostal. And then fifth, warring civil religions. Religion of the right or religion of the left. So, what do you think will happen next? So now I'd like to throw this over for conversation and see what you come up with, and then I will deliver the truth, because I know. <laughs> to people who would like to have it and Crystal Evans is going to pass this around as you raise your hand. Or what further questions do you have about what might happen next?
20 years from now, there will be tremendous changes in the whole planet from the climate, rising seas, etc. How will that fact impact the reaction of the Christian community? Yeah, uh, good, good question. And that, that will launch me into um, some of my own uh, uh, suspicions and hopes. So take this with several grains of salt, because I'm, I'm, I'm usually wrong about everything. Uh, it seems to me the, the, the most serious problem with religion in America, and maybe the Protestant mainline in particular, is that people have stopped asking, or at least many people, particularly in younger generations, the old-fashioned meaning of life questions. <clears throat> Why are we here? Why were we born? What happens when we die? What are we supposed to be doing in the meantime? In other words, the culture has become worldly. Uh, materialistic, consumeristic, narcissistic, uh, and the, the, the impression is given that if you just play your cards right, you can have a happy life on earth, and who could want anything more? And advertising is promising salvation. You may remember a few years ago there was a Volkswagen commercial where an actress dressed like a nun pointed to a Volkswagen and said, this car can save your soul. So the uh, uh, commodity, commodities have become the new religion. Um, so I, I hate to sound like a curmudgeon, uh, but, but I think the perception that maybe life isn't always going to be hunky-dory, either for individuals or for humanity as a whole, or the globe as a whole, might be salutary. As you, as you say, well, you know, we've got a problem here. Uh, the, the earth is being destroyed. What are we going to do about it? Venice is underwater. Uh, why, that might trigger a new round of why are we here questions. What's the meaning of life? And the, and the answer that the meaning of life is just to acquire more stuff or more experiences or try to be moderately happy in worldly terms is going to be less plausible as people see that, no, there is a limit to growth, and odds are you won't get through life unscathed by tragedy. Let's and take some go. questions on the other side. Mm -hmm. I'm not wise over here. Yes. Can I? I'm... Hello? Uh, my perception is that people do not have a need because of their well-being and all this other stuff. And in order for religion to grow, they either have to create a need or perceive a need. And with all of this stuff that you were referring to, goes along with that. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think there's some truth in that. Personally, I do think, uh, I am going to side with the great theologian Augustine, uh, who said that our hearts are restless until they rest in God. So I think there is an intrinsic restlessness in human beings. Or with the desert fathers and mothers who said that humans are created with a cavity that only God can fill. And the problem is we fill it full of junk. Uh, in the contemporary world, I think the problem is that the combination of technology, advertising, material wealth, um, and including medicine, uh, have all conspired to anesthetize the rest of the heart, or to successfully fill that God-shaped hole with junk, so that many people are not asking those old meaning of life questions that I think fuel all religions. So Christianity and every other religion may have to go out of its way to stir up those questions. And that's a counter-cultural thing, uh, because the messages from the culture, the messages from uh, e-advertising and television and the malls, is that if you just have the right product, you'll be absolutely happy and fulfilled. So we have a, a big task in front of us. This is a parallel thing. Um, Luther thought that the essence of Christianity is the message that 
God forgives and accepts you just as you are. That worked in a society where people felt guilty. And you could assume they felt guilty and sinful. But that doesn't fly in a culture where people don't feel guilty for sin. <laughs> Usually it's like, well, rejoice. Here's the good news. God loves you and forgives you. So that's nice. I didn't know there was anything wrong with me in the first place. So, unfortunately, I think Christians and other members of other religions, particularly the leadership, are going to have to go through a phase in which they seem really depressing. Because they're going to have to help people get in touch with the negativities of human experience. Saying, no, things are not all okay. And um, in this life, they never will be. Wait. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been in the back here, so it's hard to, hard to see me. Um, I am a pastor in the UCC. I'm also a uh, proud millennial, smack dab in the middle of the generation born in 91. Um, and so I just wanted to offer up what my experiences have been uh, and the conversations that I have with many people of my generation, and especially uh, younger generations, Gen Z. Um, and so it might end up being a little bit uh, in, in pushback to uh, what has, has been offered um, already, and especially in regards to kind of going back to the conversation around climate change and what might the future of the planet Earth mean for the future of Christianity. Um, and of course, no generation is a monolith, so I can't speak for everyone. Um, you know, I'm limited in that regard, but definitely the millennials that, that I know are very much concerned about the issues of our world, right? We are defined so much by the global issues. We've, we were born with the technology we have now, but we have grown up and adapted with it very easily. 9-11 uh, completely has shaped the entire course of our generation, and so we actually, in my experience and in my studies, are a really embodied generation. We care a lot about doing things and putting beliefs into practice. And I think, for me, that's one discrepancy that, that I see that I think generations of the past and Christianity before us, and largely I think we, what, what you've been saying, have been about orthodoxy, about our beliefs, about asking those really big questions about who we are and why are we here and what are we supposed to do, and then that has led to orthopraxy and putting our beliefs into action. But I see the millennial generations and younger kind of responding almost in reverse, that we see the issues of our world as being so paramount, so dramatic. We are so concerned about climate change and about economic injustice and about all of these issues that are facing our world that we want a faith that says, okay, we're gonna we're gonna put it into action right now, and we're gonna we're gonna address these concerns head on. And then a lot of people, even if they aren't sure what they believe, will come to church or come to a place that's doing that work. And if the church isn't doing that work, then younger generations aren't going to come because we want to be first and foremost putting our faith into action. But then when we do come, if then we're also receiving the important things about community and about sharing life and about being vulnerable and honest, then I see that leading back into orthodoxy questions as well. So I don't think it's about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but I think there's a really important element there about, about what we're actually doing rather than are we just talking about what we believe and how we believe differently being, being the primary thing. Uh, and the last thing that I that I want to say that I that I'm just noticing here is, you know, um, the question often is where are the millennials, right? Where where are they in our churches? And yet I'm a millennial pastor, right? I've only I've grown up in the church and I've only ever known a church in decline. That's all I've known. I don't know the glory days of the 50s and 60s and 70s, right? And so for me, I'm not grieving the way that it seems to me that other generations are, because I've only ever known this, but yet I know, because I've been called to ministry right now, that God is still working, and God is still doing new things. So for me, I don't even know if I'm 
100% super concerned about all these different theories uh, about what the future of the church might look like because I guess I just have utter confidence that God is doing a new thing and that the resurrection power, no matter what it might look like, is going to be at work. You know, like I believe so much in the Holy Spirit in breaking into our world and leading through that the future, I mean, we're going to have to adapt and it's probably going to look different and it's going to be really, really hard to do that stuff. Um, but I think part of me, I just, I, I feel a lot of grief around these conversations still, right? Rather than a excitement in the possibilities of what God is doing new. And I wish that the conversation could shift to there because I think that's where we're losing a lot of the younger generations. Well, just uh, if I could respond to that. Actually, the surveys weren't focused on orthodoxy. No, 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 I think have that by that. Um, but rather, and, and thank you for pushing back and, and, and putting in a good word for millennials. And you have drawn attention to the fact that uh, millennials and younger, actually it's true across generations, but it might be mostly true uh, millennials and younger, are very socially concerned and often very politically active. But what I'd like to suggest is that often that political activism becomes the whole enchilada mm -hmm. and the transcendent dimension of the faith, the spirituality part, uh, the trying to get in touch with the infinite and the eternal drops out of the picture. So you think of Christianity as having a, uh, a horizontal dimension, love your neighbor, but also a vertical dimension, love God and uh, unite in faith and love with God. Um, I think for many folk, at least according to these statistics, and my own observations, for many younger people, the horizontal dimension becomes sort of uh, self-sufficient, and the vertical dimension gets lost. I'm, again, thinking of my, my nephew, who said, why should I go to church when I can get the same charge out of a Bernie Sanders rally? And I can channel all my passion for social amelioration, for uh, uh, saving the planet, for being green, for eliminating poverty. I can do that through political events. Now, there are always exceptions. There are always you know, generations are not emotions. Uh, but what worries me is uh, a, a kind of reduction of Christianity to social activism. Uh, which I think would mean that in the long run, it will, it will be seriously diminished. Because folk do have other questions besides social justice. What's the point? Why was I born? What happens when you die? And those, those things, all world religions have addressed one way or another. Why do bad things happen? Why is there suffering? Um, and my fear is that the culture is muting those questions and giving people the impression that if only we had the right politicians in place and the right policies, all would be well for the universe. Uh, and as a result, religion is becoming sort of odious. And by religion, I don't mean institutional or orthodox or orthodoxy. But so, should we save religion or should we save the world? And well, I think um, that's not a first choice option. I think the two are uh, synthesizable. In fact, they require each other. That you need some spiritual grounding to save the world. And if you have spiritual grounding, you won't want to save the world. So I think the two actually go hand in hand. I've got a hand for me the mic, so I guess I'll go. Um, you had talked about getting one concept was bringing all the churches together in a cooperative manner. And I was wondering if you could give examples of that, because my working with the churches, I couldn't get people to cooperate within a diet, within a denomination, let alone between denominations. So what leads to any thoughts along that line? Yeah, well, I didn't endorse that thing. <laughs> I just reported it. Uh, Actually, there's a, a great deal to be said against that view. One is that as mergers happen, 
local identities become more diffuse and diluted. And that means loyalty becomes diffuse and diluted. So that, um, okay, I hope this isn't being recorded because I'm trying to say something about the UCC. I think there was more loyalty to the Congregational Church and more loyalty to the German Reformed Church than there is now to the UCC. Usually mergers like that lead to a kind of generic uh, identity. Um, I have one, one secular friend who I was trying to get interested in Christianity. I gave him some, I gave him some Catholic literature. And I gave him some UCC literature. And his response was, I could actively dis disbelieve in the Catholic God. Because the Catholic God has some meat. He said, the UCC God is not worth the trouble to disbelieve in. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not endorsing that here. But it, 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 I'm, I'm not sanguine about generic ecumenical Christianity. Just as, um, I'm not sanguine about, it, well, in, in, in high school, we had on the menu at our cafeteria, Sometimes it just said, meat. <laughs> it didn't say beef, it didn't say ham, it didn't say bacon. I like beef, ham, bacon, turkey, chicken. I'm not sure about meat. <laughs> With uh, all these surveys and so forth, and the statistical analysis, are we ever questioning the people that don't go to church, the millennials, the young people, to see what would create an interest to them. Why do you go to church? Why do you not go to church? Is it boring? What would make it an attraction yeah. to you? Uh, good, 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 good question. And actually, we have had uh, doctor of ministry students here who've done projects on that. One who's doing a project right now on millennial spirituality, or, or lack thereof. And what she's finding through her interviews uh, is that the response is not so much hostility to uh, Christianity, but just not even on the radar screen. But nor is Hinduism or uh, even New Age spirituality. It's just that no form of spirituality is on, on the radar screen. Uh, political action, yeah, but, but any form of what we might call uh, religious spirituality, piety, not so much. So before anything positive will happen, I think those old yearnings for transcendence, for meaning, will have to be awakened. Is there anything to do with a liturgical uh, experience? It could. Uh, for some, it, they, liturgical traditions, they're often not growing, but they're holding their own. Uh, and in fact, we used to have a youth program here where the... Uh, the, the youth participants would often say when they got here, can we please worship in the chapel with the organ? So, Cut out the drums and guitars. We can hear that anytime. But the chapel and the organ is different, it's awesome, and it's cool. So, uh, their liturgical traditions, I think, will, will, will survive, might even flourish. Um, Eastern Orthodoxy is growing a little by conversion. I am a product of the baby boomer age. You're kidding. And I am, I am uh, as such, I'm addicted to the television. One of the things I would counter you saying that we are not, <coughs> excuse me, specifically spiritual people are the number of television shows on what used to be mainline uh, networks like God Friended Me and Evil and The Good Place where people are wrestling with deeper questions. Maybe it's somewhat superficial, but it's still out there for the population. How do you respond? Oh, I think, I, I think you're right. I think the uh, culture can try to anesthetize the restless heart, but it can't kill it. So, uh, a yearning for God will pop up in all <coughs> religious places, uh, including very commercial mainstream television or movies uh, or 
even sporting events. Um, right? Uh, Brown Williams, who uh, had the uh, theology professor in, 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 in England, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, did a tour of the United States talking about spirituality. And somebody asked him, um, you must be depressed that there is so little spirituality in the United States. And he said, what do you mean? It's the most spiritual place I've ever been. He just said, it's just sad that none of it's happening in churches. Because uh, he said, go to a rock concert. That's a celebration of the numinous, of all, or, or halftime in any football game. He said, people are getting a dose of old-fashioned, reformed, glory, majesty, all. Um, it's just that the, the church is not capitalizing on that whatsoever. So yeah, there, 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 there are, I think, um, spirituality is, I think, irrepressible. Even if folk ignore it, and the culture tries to anesthetize it, it's going to pop up. Why don't we take just one more question as we pass the hour? <laughs> I think we've got one over there. Oh, you were first. Oh, yes. Yeah, you got the mic. I'm thinking about the future of the traditional church and how it will evolve. Will we still be singing "Oh Come All Ye Faithful" in 20 years? And some of the I mean, some of the traditional churches that do attract many people right now. What about tradition? Yeah, the, um, I think the tra traditions will survive. They'll be fluid, and people might patch them together, individuals in a unique kind of crazy quilt pattern like pick and choose from a variety of traditions, but they're not going to disappear from the same way. Now, standard congregations as we know them now, more or less in the Protestant main line, um, I think Christianity in the future will be very different. Uh, it will borrow and, and preserve elements from our traditional worship and uh, organizations, etc. Uh, but it still will be different. But I'm not afraid of that. Uh, Phyllis Tickle, in spite of her arbitrary 500 year rummage sale theory, I think is on to something. Christianity has evolved and changed drastically through the centuries. It wasn't always, it, denominations didn't really get off the ground until the 17th century. Uh, congregations sometimes have not been the bearers of Christianity. For a while, it was monasteries, and sometimes it's been revival meetings out on the frontier. So congregations will, or the Christian communities will change in ways that I can't foresee. But I am a believing Christian, and I do believe that God is sovereign, and that the Holy Spirit is at work, and that the Holy Spirit is still at work in the church, and that something new will be birthed. You can't keep the Holy Spirit now. Something's going to happen. Um, what that is, I still, I think, is anybody's guess. I've got some punches, but it will be something. Well, let us accept those gracious words as a benediction.